Welcome. I am Kit Poliano, Dean of the Division of Biological Sciences at UC San Diego. I am pleased to welcome you to this Deep Look event, which is focused on the many innovations that have resulted from the unprecedented challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, we will hear from UC San Diego's chancellor, two outstanding faculty and an alumnus who, like many top scientists worldwide, have focused their creative energies to combating this pandemic. First, it is my pleasure to introduce UC San Diego Chancellor Pradeep Kosla, who has led the campus since 2012 and who leads the multifaceted response to the pandemic that has allowed us to safely return students to campus, partner with San Diego County and school districts. Chancellor Pradeep K. Kosla is an internationally renowned electrical and computer engineer recognized for his seminal contributions to secure software and intelligent robot systems. As UC San Diego's chief executive officer, Kosla has positioned the institution to define the future of the public research university by activating the institution's first ever strategic plan and launching the campaign for UC San Diego, an ambitious 10-year, $2 billion endeavor aimed at transforming the university physically, culturally, and intellectually. Under Kosla's leadership, UC San Diego has expanded college access and affordability for underserved students, initiated campus-wide interdisciplinary research initiatives to foster collaboration and solve societal challenges, and strengthen university and community partnerships to drive regional impact. UC San Diego's response to COVID-19, called the Return to Learn program, has made national headlines for its many innovations, ranging from COVID-19 tests and vending machines, hundreds of wastewater testing sites across the campus, and partnerships to launch vaccine super sites. Chancellor Kosla, thank you for joining us here today, and thank you for your innovative leadership during these unprecedented times. To start, can you please tell us how the early plans for formulating the Return to Learn strategy came together? Thank you, Dean Poliana, and I really appreciate you inviting me for this uh, conversation. Uh, and as I think about how, how the early plans came together, I cannot help but counting the number of months we've been in this pandemic, and it is nearly a year. I think it was around March 11th or something like that that uh, I put out an order out to send the students home. And the plans for this started about a month or so before that. I was uh, talking to Chip Schooley, who, uh, for people who don't know Chip Schooley, is one of the leading infectious disease people on our campus. And he's also part of the administration uh, dealing with international, opera, uh, international students. So we were just chit-chatting, and he talked about this uh, virus being a potential problem, and it could lead, down, lead us to close the campus completely and shut our operations. And that uh, scared me a lot. I mean, I was very concerned by that statement. Uh, and the more I thought about it, the more I realized that if we were to get ahead of this, we could actually be operational uh, while keeping our community safe. So that's how it all started in that little conversation in my office. What made it possible for UC San Diego to be the first university in the nation to announce such ambitious plans for repopulating university campus as safely as possible? I think what made it possible was my understanding that we had just about every uh, specialty that was needed to address this problem right here on campus, number one. Uh, I knew we had a very collaborative faculty who would cross boundaries very seamlessly. Uh, and I just made sure that money and resources were not gonna be an impediment. So I promised myself early on that we're not gonna use money as a reason uh, to not do the right thing. And once I had all of that in my head, I was now a free person to start making bold promises and moves betting 100% or on my faculty uh, to deliver without even knowing whether they would or not. But, you know, it worked because that's the confidence a chancellor needs to have in his faculty. That's great. So why was it important to bring together experts from so many different areas? You had, you still work with people in infectious disease, modeling, bioinformatics and student affairs and, and biologists. So why, why were all these people important for the response? 
so I have to tell you, uh, it was not clear to me that these people were important for the response up front. But the more questions I ask, and people who work with me know that I have this uh, bad habit of asking too many questions. Uh, and I do that partly to learn more and partly to force people to think a little bit differently. And the more questions I asked, the more I realized uh, that just being an infectious disease person was not gonna be good enough. So for example, I was talking to Chip, and I said, how do we know how does a virus propagate? Uh, and at that time, remember it was more like a surface propagation model as to that's where the infection was uh, staying and traveling. Well, I said, okay, I get that, but between me, the human having the virus and touching a surface and somebody else coming and touching the surface, what does that pro population propagation look like? And uh, Chip says, you know, we have this great uh, faculty member, a young faculty member whose name is Natasha Martin, and she's one of the best modelers. So I said, okay, let's bring her in. Uh, so then I had this question about, okay, so it's on a surface. So how long does it last on a surface? What do we know about that? So if you just think about me and Chip and others thinking about this as a research problem, we kept on asking questions and that led to adding more and more and more people uh, to this uh, team. That's great. Thank you. Uh, you know, so one of the most striking aspects of the campus response is exactly this large team of experts that you brought together that don't typically work together. As a leader, how did you bring these individuals together so productively? I mean, look, I think part of it was luck, but I think part of it also was the, uh, the DNA of this campus, which is all about collaboration and problem solving. And I think part of it was the urgency of the issue and the importance of the issue where everybody felt committed to really address the issue rather than grind their own ax. So that's what I call, that's where I think I lucked out. And I did this in a slightly unorthodox way where we would have these meetings on Zoom with 50, 60, 70 people in the meeting. And it was more like a research lab meeting. If I just look back now, and uh, Kit, you were involved in these meetings. Uh, where everybody could ask questions and answer, and we would have give and take. Uh, and then in the end, we would have some sort of a directional answer, which we would then refine later on, right? So it worked out really well. And going forward, I'm thinking, you know, maybe this is a better way of uh, organizing solutions to issues where the problem is not defined up front completely, where the evolution of the definition keeps on happening over time and the team keeps on changing and morphing over time, adding more people, not adding, uh, un, 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 you know, deleting some people, that type of stuff, right? In this case, we only added people. I think by the, like today is a COG meeting. There's like 80 people on the call. Yeah, I, I've really enjoyed those meetings. One of the things that's really interesting is the, the kind of flat structure of people are from all different levels of the institution with all different levels of expertise and you never know where the productive question will come from. And we added people, uh, you know, so for example, when everybody was thinking this is uh, surface transmission, um, our faculty, uh, Dr. Kim Prather and also Dr. Chip Schooley, started talking about, no, it doesn't make sense. It is more aerosols, it is more air transmission. So even though the CDC had not opined, the WHO had not opined, my view is my faculty have opined, so I'm gonna listen to them. So I brought uh, Dr. Prater to be part of this conversation. And it only uh, enriched the whole conversation, uh, forced people to think slightly differently. So, and the same exactly at, at one point, uh, we did not know much about air circulation and the issue of air circulation. And you kid posed the question. And uh, then we had people working on air circulation, air model, modeling uh, air flows. <laughs> That's been incredibly informative as well. So thank you so much for your leadership throughout this time. No, thank you for your leadership. I think without uh, you, uh, the other deans and the faculty, uh, we would not be where we are, so. So why was it important to have a foundation of three pillars for return to learn? Viral detection, intervention, and risk mitigation. Looking back, it looks like uh, we had thought this up front. But as I look back, and I'm trying to be honest, I think this also evolves. As we thought about everything we had done, uh, and we said, okay, now how do we 
categorize what we had done uh, into the strategies we were following. So clearly, if you want to uh, manage a pandemic, you got to detect the virus. You got to understand where is it traveling, how far is it traveling. You got to figure out uh, how do you stop the travel, uh, right? Which is some combination of intervention and risk mitigation. And then you got to bring all the technologies into play. So we were, for example, the first one back in April when we announced uh, wastewater testing. Nobody knew what it was. Uh, and folks, uh, including Dr. Rob Knight, said we can do it. And my view is if my faculty tell me we can do it, then I'm just going to bet on my faculty and I'm going to double down on those bets. And there we were. And Rob Knight actually delivered. <laughs> Great. Can you please tell us about some of the innovations that allowed Return to Learn success? I think uh, can, there are many, many innovations. So uh, clearly wastewater testing was one of them. Uh, clearly, you know, it seems obvious now, but the recognition that it was in the air and aerosol transmission, uh, the recognition of that was, I think, an innovation, not the fact that uh, the aerosol, does that make sense? Uh, I think, uh, the recognition that uh, airflow might have some role to play in mitigating the risks uh, in congregate settings. Uh, and then at some point when we were going from uh, hardly any capacity, 200 to about five or 6,000 a day, uh, the innovations, uh, which actually people don't talk about, uh, I realized that the federal government at that time could cut off our supply chain anytime they wanted. Uh, and they were actually doing that. They were hijacking supply chains. So we had like four different supply chains established. We had Illumina, we had uh, Thermo Fisher, we had multiple ways of doing this. We had saliva testing, we had nasal swabs. So we had like three or four different supply chains established so that they could not take any, all four away. So they could take one or two away, which would diminish our capacity, but they could not uh, bring this operation to a halt. Now, look, it looks like we were not trusting of uh, the bureaucracy that exists. The fact is we were not trusting of the bureaucracy that, ex that existed then uh, on the outside because they were actually uh, trying to mess with this operation. And my goal was to keep my community safe. So uh, the other innovation that, uh, so at one point we went from uh, twice a month testing to once every week testing. And we realized that uh, the issue of uh, access was problematic. If every student had to make a phone call or go to a website, it would not work. It would not scale that easily. Uh, and being an engineer and especially an IT person, I know that when you want to scale something fast, you got to bring the friction down to zero. And the best way to bring the friction, the friction in this case was picking up the phone call, going on a website. So we did this vending machines. Somebody had this idea and we said, oh, that, let's do the vending machines, you know? So now we have vending machines, nobody schedules anything. You just go swab yourself and uh, there we are. So we connected the ability for a self-swabbing test with the vending machines and put it all together. So none of this was a plan at T equal to zero. All of this evolved over time. Yeah, it's really, really neat. Do you have a favorite innovation or something you consider the most innovative aspect of Return to Earn? Uh, you know, I mean, look, I think there's, a, there's many, many innovative aspects of Return to Learn, but I can tell you what to me was the most surprising aspect of Return to Learn is a different way to think about this. Uh, when we were thinking about this, the community was saying, wait a second, you're going to bring 10,000 students here uh, and you, these people are not going to behave properly and they're going to make us all sick and you're just going to uh, hurt the community which actually was very concerning to me, including some of our students uh, and faculty and staff signed up for this type of uh, rhetoric. So I had to think very deeply about this, talk to many people. Uh, in the end, we, didn't bring the, we did bring about 10,000 students back. And what was most surprising to me, uh, partly because of our strategies, but partly because of uh, their commitment, was the behavior of these students. So the single biggest uh, determinant of a system falling apart, whether it's cybersecurity or pandemic, is a human being. And in this case, the human being being our students behaved 
uh, very well. Our vice chancellor for student affairs, she ran a spectacular operation, motivating them to behave well. Uh, we had multiple things happening where uh, we had health ambassador program. This, these were peers who would walk around campus watching for uh, people not following protocol. So if you were wearing a mask, suddenly you might get a $5 gift card for Starbucks. If you're not wearing a mask, uh, you would get a little tap on your shoulder saying, please wear a mask. So it was all peer uh, operated, uh, peer pressure, people working with each other to secure everybody. So, I, so th that was actually an innovative aspect. And as we are in this pandemic right now, so we have told everybody that if you test once a week for 10 weeks in this quarter, we will donate $50 on your behalf to the food pantry and other uh, needs for the students. This gives them a good motivation to really help their colleagues, their peers who need help by just behaving better. And guess what? We are seeing a lot of uh, uptake on this. Fantastic. Looking back, would you have done anything differently? I don't know. Even I don't think I would, to be honest with you. I know the right answer is, uh, yeah, I would have. But I have looked back. And even though if I knew the whole problem, this is not the way one would solve a problem. But the more I've thought about this, it seems to me that every problem keeps on evolving as we learn more and more. So I would create a dynamic solution strategy the way we had here, where the group starts off as a small group, then it keeps on expanding depending on the needs and the issues that arise in the problem statement and our understanding of the problem. And they just get integrated and we keep on, as they say, build the plane while flying it. And it has worked really well. I know it sounds counterintuitive to build a plane while flying it because it should not work, but it, in this case, it did work. We solved the problem while the problem was evolving. Well, you have a virus that is evolving and therefore the response needs to Right, evolve. and our understanding of the problem is evolving. And if you just take a step back and think about that's exactly how we as faculty members do our research, uh, because that's how we keep on evolving our understanding and the definition uh, and keep on addressing different branches that arise in the problem. That's great, thank you. Looking ahead with UC San Diego playing such an active role in the region's vaccination strategy, what's your message to those unsure about getting vaccinated for COVID-19 or are those frustrated because they can't yet make an appointment? So my message is very optimistic, it is to be patient. I know it's easy for me to say that, but we have been in this for a year now. Uh, I think as I look at the situation right now, by mid-April, we should have a lot of vaccine availability. Uh, and we're already moving from tier 1A to 1B. Uh, the websites are becoming better and better. We are starting more, uh, our capacity. So as we speak right now, our Petco Park was closed for three days because we had no vaccines. So now we are at a point where we don't, it's not the vaccine, uh, it's not our inability to deliver the vaccine, it's our ability to get vaccine delivery, <laughs> right? So once we have more vaccines, I think we'll be in good shape. Remac is open now. So I'm very bullish about where we are headed. And I think UC San Diego, and for that matter, any public university, uh, an R1 public university with this capacity should be playing an important role in uh, helping the community become more secure and safe. That's great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for your leadership and for making UC San Diego the resource to the community that we need to be. It's really been a pleasure yeah. participating in this process, just even peripherally, and I've, I feel lucky to have you as chancellor. Thank you, Dean Pogliano, and I feel fortunate to have uh, you as one of our deans. And let me just say a big shout out to our faculty. Uh, they were amazing in the way they collaborated. And most of all, to our students. I mean, without you, we could not have done it. Uh, because of you, we exist. And without you, we could not have done this, uh, main, uh, managed this pandemic. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chancellor Kosla. And now we'll hear from two of our faculty and one of our alum about their amazing work that they've done on COVID-19. I'm pleased to introduce Biological Sciences Associate Professor Omar Akbari, 
who will describe a new tool for detecting the SARS-CoV-2 virus based on CRISPR genetic editing technology. Omar received a BS MS degree in biotechnology and a PhD in cell and molecular biology from the University of Nevada, Reno. He became an assistant professor of entomology in the Center for Infectious Disease Vector Research at UC Riverside. And in fall of 2017, he joined the UC San Diego faculty as an assistant professor in the section of cell and developmental biology. In 2018, he co-founded and became a scientific advisor for Agrogene, a biotechnology startup company located in San Diego, California. Welcome, Omar. Thank you so much for, for having me here today. I thank the Division of Biological Sciences for hosting uh, this, this event today. Um, today, I'm gonna talk to you about development of a CRISPR-CASRX-based diagnostic system, which we termed sensor. So SARS-CoV-2, um, we all know about SARS-CoV-2. It's the causative virus of a respiratory illness known as COVID-19, um, originating from Wuhan, China in 2019. Uh, this virus has spread globally, primarily by contact droplets and airborne transmission. Um, since January of 2020, last year, just last year, we have over 100 million global cases and 2 million global deaths. And those numbers are rising every single day. It's, it's really staggering. So, you know, our lab traditionally develops technologies to combat human pathogens. We focus a lot of our work on arboviruses which are things transmitted by mosquitoes, for example, like malaria, dengue, West Nile, yellow fever, Zika virus, et cetera. And you know, as of March of 2020, our lab pivoted some of our work to working on SARS-CoV-2. And in the green arrows pictured here are actually people in the lab that stopped some of their previous work to transition to working on SARS-CoV-2. And this was the last lab picture that we took in our lab um, since the pandemic started. So when we started thinking about SARS-CoV-2, we identified two main areas of focus. And one of them was this, you know, there was a need to develop rapid scalable diagnostics at that time. And then there was also a big need to develop rapid scalable vaccines and, and obviously manufacturing, deployment and distribution of those vaccines. Now, the manufacturing, deployment, and distribution of vaccines is still a problem today. You know, there's almost 8 billion people on Earth, and some of these vaccines required multiple doses. So getting 16 billion, or, yeah, 16 billion doses out there is, is a manufacturing uh, problem at this point. And, you know, we all know that the, the virus is evolving and mutating, and there's new variants. So in the future, we may need new vaccines. So there might be second doses and third doses. I hope not, but that's kind of where we're headed. So going back to rapid scalable diagnostics, we kind of decided to focus our work on that. And so we, we looked into this. And so really there's um, three main things to measure for diagnostics. And the first thing one can measure is antigens. So there's antigen testing, which essentially is I'm developing amino acids that can detect the presence of specific viral proteins. So when you get infected with the virus, it's going to replicate, it's going to have proteins that you can detect with these antigen tests. These are pretty rapid, they can be portable, they can require minimal equipment. Some of the cons with these are they require the virus to be uh, to mature and they're not useful for identifying asymptomatic or presymptomatic patients. And as of today, there's actually 14 different approved, FDA approved emergency use authorization tests on the market. We can also use antibody testing and antibodies are essentially proteins that the body is producing in response to infections. Um, the pros of these are that they can be used to determine if you're previously infected. The cons are they don't rule out if an active infection. So antibodies can be produced even if you have no symptoms. Um, and these also take time to be made. So one to three weeks following an infection. Um, as of today, there's actually 69 different FDA approved emergency use authorization antibody tests on the market for SARS-CoV-2. And then the gold standard really is nucleic acid testing and primarily RT-PCR, reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction. 
Um, this is extremely sensitive. It's easily it's easy to program, so you can design it to target different regions of the virus. It's very reliable. The cons are that it requires very specialized equipment. The turnaround time takes a bit longer, 10 to 15 hours. It also requires a laboratory and trained technicians. Um, as of today, there's 209 different FDA emergency use authorization approved tests for nucleic acid testing. Not all of them are RT-PCR based, but, there, but there's 209 total for nucleic acid testing. So another type of nucleic acid test that is kind of being developed, a newer type, are these CRISPR-DX systems. On the right here, this image on the right, you can see that there's a number of different tests that have been developed. Many of them were developed in 2020. And these use different CRISPR either nucleases, things that target DNA, like Cas9, uh, DCAS9, or Cas12A or Cas12B, or even RNA-targeting ribonucleases like Cas13A, Cas13B, and Cas13D. In terms of CRISPR diagnostics, there's two tests that are FDA emergency use authorization for SARS-CoV-2 on the market today, and those are marketed by two companies, primarily Sherlock and Mammoth Biosciences. And, and these tests are pretty rapid and they can be specific. They can have multiple different readouts. Some of the cons of these is that they, they currently require multiple transfers. They can be complex to set up and, and they are not as sensitive as RT-PCR. So, you know, we, we actually developed a, a CRISPR-based diagnostic system, which we call Sensor, which is pictured here. And I'll talk about that. So, you know, at the time we were, we were working with uh, this CRISPR ribonuclease called CASRX. It's a Cas13D based ribonuclease that was discovered in 2018. And we were testing this system in animals and specifically in flies. And this is a picture of our paper that was published in the CRISPR journal when we tested this system. But basically what we found was that we can get really high rates of on-target cleavage of RNA but we also get really high rates of collateral off targeting. And, and it was very severe in that we could actually kill flies with this system. So we knew how, how well the system worked. And so we want to pivot that system to a diagnostic. And that's when we developed Sensor, which is a sensitive enzymatic nucleic acid sequence recognition system. And we, we started this project of, of using CASRX to detect SARS-CoV-2 in, in just March of 2020. And by October of 2020, we had our first paper out and meta archive of, of how our system works to detect uh, SARS-CoV-2, the sensor system. And so how does our system work? Well, it's um, at this point, it's, it's a two-step reaction where one takes a sample, um, it could be a swab or it could be a saliva sample and isolates the, the RNA and then puts it into this reaction which is called an RTRPA. RPA stands for recombinase polymerase amplification. This basically converts the viral RNA into DNA with a T7 promoter that then goes into an in vitro transcription reaction and also gets detected at the same time. And there's two different readouts you can use, either fluorescence or lateral flow. Both of them work pretty well. And the whole system takes about you know, um, 15 to 60 minutes to complete the assay. It has a comparable sensitivity to other CRISPR diagnostic systems with a limit of detection of 50 to 100 copies per microliter, which is good enough for detection of people that are infectious. So this is just some of the data that we had from UCSD. Um, and this is actual patient sample data where we tested um, the two different formats, either the fluorescent assay or the lateral flow assay on the bottom here. And depending on the viral titer, so this line here is a CT value. So the lower the CT value, the higher the viral titer. So when you have a really high viral titer, our, our assay worked really well. But as the viral titer sort of tapered off, it, it worked, you know, it wasn't able to detect as well. So all 36 of these patient samples are positive for SARS-CoV-2. Um, so we had a pretty good positive selection and we didn't have very many false positives, which is great. But the system is definitely not as sensitive as, as RT-PCR. But the lateral flow format makes it really robust and cheap for point of care testing of nucleic acids. So, um, you know, we were really excited about this. The system works pretty well for detecting SARS-CoV-2, and we're working to optimize it a little bit more. 
So this is our first, our first go at this. And some of the featured directions of this are that we are working right now to improve sensitivity. So instead of using RTRPA, we're trying LAMP, which is 10x more sensitive in our system. And we're also trying to design it to have less transfers. So we want to have a one pot reaction where we can just put everything in one tube and then get a, a readout. Um, and we're also trying to change the temperatures that things work at. So we're trying different enzymes and things like that. So we're actually doing quite a lot of innovation in terms of diagnostics, which can be useful for you know, SARS-CoV-2 potentially now, or maybe the next pandemic or detecting other pathogens. Going forward, you know, we recently, I recently pitched this deck to DARPA and the idea that we came up with is detect and protect. And in collaboration with a few companies, Hive Biosciences and Bioamerica, which is based out of Irvine, the idea was to develop detection systems that can be used to protect warfighters and the public. And we really wanted to focus on developing a rapid airport diagnostic because there's not really anything that exists right now. Something that where you can just you know, walk through the terminal and then know whether you're positive or negative within five to 10 minutes. So what we want to do is try to, to combine our rapid nucleic acid diagnostics with point of care instrumentation that can be used you know, in airport settings and then in collaboration with uh, Bioamerica, you know, get the manufacturing and distribution of the system. So this is something that we're working on now. We have a lot of ideas on how to innovate this and this is in progress right now. So with that said, I mean, that's basically my last slide. Um, just want to thank you for your time. I'm really happy to be here. I really want to give a shout out to the lab and all the people with the green arrows here that have contributed to the, the detection system that I talked about today, specifically uh, Dan Brogan and DuVernay and Calvin Lin, who led the project. Also our collaborators, the Comey's lab and the, and the Knight lab, um, specifically Pedro Bell de Ferre, who actually was instrumental in getting the patients, you know, helping us get patient samples to, to test the system. And our funds, right? We also got some seed funds at UCSD um, through the emergent COVID-19 related research to, to help accelerate this, this project. And I think our, we're gonna have a lot more um, research in this area of diagnostics. And I think it's a, a really important um, thing to continue developing. So thank you so much. Thank you, Omar. That was a great talk. Next, we will hear from chemistry and biochemistry professor, Romy Amaro who will present captivating insights from her highly publicized work using computational microscopes that provide unprecedented views of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Romy's scientific interests lie at the intersection of computer-aided drug discovery and biophysical simulation. She received her BS in chemical engineering and her PhD in chemistry from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And she was an NIH postdoctoral fellow with Professor Andrew McCammon at UC San Diego from 2005 to 2009 and started her independent lab at UC San Diego in 2009. She is the recipient of an NIH New Innovator Award, the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, the ACS Comp Open Eye Outstanding Junior Faculty Award, the ACS Kavli Foundation Emerging Leader in Chemistry, the Corwin Hanch Award, and the 2019 Gordon Bell Special Prize for COVID-19. Welcome, Romy. Hi, everyone. My name is Romy Amaro, and I'm here today to tell you about our work to use computational microscopy to study SARS-CoV-2. So some of you may have already heard about our work in a really beautiful New York Times piece that went to press in early to mid-October. And in this article, it, they presented some of the images that I'll tell you about today, um, as well as the work of many scientists around the world as we've really raced to try to understand the molecular piece parts of the virus to really get a better understanding of how it infects humans and, and the spread of disease. So by now, everyone I'm sure is already familiar with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. I'm showing you one of our renditions of that virus here. What I wanna draw your attention to is sort of what it looks like. So it basically looks like a golf ball with pinpoints sticking out of it. Those points are basically what we call the spike proteins. And we are very concerned with these spike proteins because they sit on the outside of the virus and so are the first point of contact that the virus has with the human cell. So we and others are very interested in understanding how these proteins work and how they actually attach to and infect 
uh, the human cell. It's also one of the major antigenic components of the virus. And as such, uh, some of you may be familiar with already some of the vaccines, which indeed actually encode for this particular protein. So during the SARS-CoV-2 infection process, one of the things that needs to happen, in fact, one of the really first events, is that this so-called spike protein that I just told you about needs to uh, come into contact with a protein on the human cell. This protein I'm showing here in yellow, this is called ACE2. This protein here uh, that's white and blue is the spike protein. And here in the middle panel, you can really see how they sort of come together and make this very close, what I like to call sort of a handshake between the virus and the host cell. And one thing I want to, one part of the spike protein that we and other researchers are particularly interested to understand is this blue bit, this light blue bit in the middle. This is called the receptor binding domain, or as it's often referred to just by its initials, it's called the RBD. This is really the main point of the virus that comes into contact with that human cell receptor. And so um, we're going to take a deeper view into uh, this particular part of the protein. So in my group, what we are doing is actually using computational methods to explore the sort of fine details all the way down to the atomic level of the virus and the spike protein. And so one of the really amazing things about uh, computational methods nowadays is that it we basically can treat them sort of like what I like to consider a computational microscope, where we can pull together data sets from, from different experimental techniques, so different structural data sets like cryo-electron microscopy and crystallography, together with things like mass spectrometry and genomics, in order to build highly detailed, incredibly accurate, like computational um, mimics of biological systems. And then all we're doing is approximating that system down to its many atoms and watching how they move over time. And we do this through uh, simulation methods um, that basically sort of approximate Newtonian physics. Um, and so one of the really beautiful things about this, I mean, aside from the math, which can get slightly complicated, but it's really not so bad. But what, these, what this technique allows us to do is to get new views into the virus that we cannot achieve with current experimental techniques. And so what I want to tell you about are some of our findings as we've used this microscope to learn new things about the virus. So, but before I do that, I just want to show you sort of what, this, what these simulations show us. So on the left here, I'm actually showing you again a different view of that really important spike protein. That blue bit, that RBD that I was telling you about, you can see it's still showing up as blue there. And then I want to draw you, you, I'm sure you're noticing in this movie, these little balls that look like ornaments hanging off of a Christmas tree and they're sort of wiggling around. One of the places where computing has a lot to give is in, into understanding something called the glycan shield. And that's what these little ornaments or these little sort of balls hanging off of the protein actually are. And so the cool thing about this technique is that experiments aren't able to actually see what those sugars look like. So these are actually like a type of sugar molecule that we have in the body and also on viruses. But we can see them with these simulations. And so this gives us this sort of unique view. So we're really interested to understand sort of what, um, what these sugars are doing and how they impact the biology of the virus. And so one of the major outcomes was our work, and one of the reasons why it received a lot of attention was because we showed the world for the first time what the spike protein really looked like. So the experimentalists, uh, basically what they see is sort of like what it looks like on the left. So this picture where it's just light blue, and you can see this is the spike protein. At the bottom here is the viral membrane. When we bring in our simulations, on the right side is what it actually looks like. So the, the, all the dark blue sort of puff balls that you see, those are those sugar molecules that are invisible to the experiments, but with computing, we can show. And so people were really, researchers were excited to know obviously what it looked like. So as, as you can see here, these sugar molecules, they sort of decorate or mask the almost the entirety of that spike protein. And that's exactly what they were largely believed to do. They act actually as a glycan shield. They call it a glycan shield or a sugary mask that basically hides the viral proteins from the human immune system. So knowing where these sugar molecules are 
um, as well as where they're not, because where they're not located reveals sort of vulnerabilities of the spike protein. This is information that's really critical to, for example, the design of novel drugs, where we wanna to try to find molecules that will bind into these sites that are exposed. One of the other uh, cool things that our work showed was that it actually showed the world why the spike protein has to undergo a particular conformational change. And um, so just showing you here, it turns out what, one thing that we learned was that the spike protein actually has sort of two different modes. It has a hidden mode or a stealth mode or a defending mode that I'm showing here on the left where those sugar molecules are basically completely covering that part of the protein that needs to make contact with the host cell. But then it has another mode. This is what we call an attacking mode or an exposed mode, where it basically lifts that important part of itself, that's infectious bit known as the RBD. It lifts it up above the glycan shield. And therefore this is like, it actually can go ahead and infect the human cell. And the thing is that I thought was really, that we think is really neat about this is that this is sort of a finding that if you didn't if you didn't know where those sugars were located and what they were doing, if you didn't have the information about the sugars that we were able to get from computation, you wouldn't have any idea that it's actually hiding in one mode and revealed in another. The other thing that we found that was pretty surprising was that we showed that there were two glycans in particular, two sugar molecules. I'm showing you here the, as shown in sort of like uh, sort of swollen uh, ball structures, that, that these two sugars actually hold up or prop that spike up in the open conformation. So it's not only that those sugar molecules are basically hiding or masking the human immune system, uh, the virus from the human immune system, but they also act as part of the viral weaponry itself by locking and loading the spike for infection to the host cell. And this was something that not only was the, we were the first to show for SARS-CoV-2, but to our knowledge, it's actually the first time it's been shown for any viral protein. So it's quite exciting, this new role for glycans that our simulations, together with experiment, established. And, you know, so that's just the beginning of what we're doing. We've also significantly expanded the scope of our simulations to actually study the spike protein in the entirety of the viral envelope. And so what I'm showing you here are some of the largest simulations that have ever been carried out for a biological system. They have roughly 300 million atoms and are running on the biggest supercomputers in the world. But this will, is like opening entirely new dimensions to the study of virology, as well as the study of antibodies and how these viruses actually infect humans human cells. And then I'm sure that many of you have also heard a considerable amount about different um, mutant forms of the virus, mutations, variants of concern. These type of computational methods that I've just told you about can also be used to very rapidly assess the impact or the potential impact that these mutations could have, not only for transmissibility, but also for, um, for the ability of uh, antibodies and vaccines to be effective. And with that, I just want to thank a really uh, a global team, highly integrated global team who's carried out uh, with me and my group a tremendous amount of research over the past uh, 10 or 11 months. Um, this includes uh, the group of Elisa Fada, shown here at the top, a terrific glycochemist and glycobiologist at Maynooth University in Dublin. Um, my members of my own group, particularly Lorenzo Casalino, Zied Gayeb, and Abigail Dahmer, who've just worked tirelessly over the past number of months at all the folks I'm showing here, um, including our experimental collaborator, Jason McClellan. He's one of the co-inventors of the Moderna vaccine and has been really key in helping us to experimentally validate a lot of the things that were coming out of experiment of the simulations. And thanks for your attention. Thank you, Romy, for that great presentation. Next, we'll hear from biological sciences alum, Dan Kolk of 1983, who is a senior diagnostic advisor with Tunnell Consulting Group Incorporated, supporting BARDA Diagnostics, who will address the future of at-home diagnostic testing in response to COVID-19. Dan has over 20 years of experience in the in vitro diagnostics industry and received his BA in biochemistry and cell biology from UC San Diego in 1983, and his PhD from Arizona State University in 1992. His PhD thesis focused on gene regulation of immune responses by cytokines. He did his postdoctoral fellowship at UC San Diego lab of William Waxman. Welcome, Dan. Thanks, uh, I'm, my name is Dan Kolk. Uh, I'm, I'd like to thank uh, the Division of Biological Sciences for inviting me to speak about uh, 
my area of expertise, which is in uh, diagnostics. I've spent my entire 25 year career in the uh, molecular diagnostics industry. And I'm going to talk to you about some of my beliefs and, uh, you know, thesis about how I think uh, COVID is going to change the uh, diagnostic uh, testing paradigm. So um, I want to just give a disclaimer before this talk. So what I think is going to happen is that you're seeing it already, in fact, that the pandemic and the uh, diagnostic medical diagnostic industry's response to it has, you know, shown some real issues with how we do medical diagnostic testing, and particularly for infectious diseases. And this is forcing us to rethink the model of how people access infectious disease testing. And so we're going to see a shift and it's on its way. It was already on its way before the pandemic, but it's the pandemic's going to speed it up and we're going to see a shift to at home testing. And this shift is, is at first, it's not going to be obvious, but this is really a cusp of something much bigger where the medical consumer who already wanted to be more involved in their medical decision making and and control of um, you know their what's going on in their body, they're going to be empowered with far more information than was thought possible just 30 years ago due to technological advances and, and other factors, which I'll go into. So uh, the goal is to make uh, at-home diagnostics testing as um, common as the toothbrush, but everyone knows that's a hard, high bar because toothbrushes are pretty inexpensive and they're pretty easy to operate. And you can't say the same about diagnostics, okay? But let's get to uh, what's going on right now in the United States in uh, COVID diagnostics. So this is a graph from uh, early March, 2020, showing the tests per thousand people, uh, both uh, nucleic acid tests. So those are what are, I'm gonna refer to as nucleic acid amplification tests. Those are what people commonly refer to as PCR, but their PCR is not actually the right name because there's lots of ways to do nucleic acid amplification tests. So I'm gonna call them NAT tests. This, this graph also includes antigen tests. Now NAT tests are extremely sensitive. It's a state of the art, but as you were told in an earlier talk, they're, they're complicated. Up until recently, they were very complicated. And antigen tests are far simpler, but and far less expensive, but they're not as sensitive. So antigen tests are easy to access, easy to manufacture, but not quite as sensitive as nucleic acid tests. So what happened? What, we all know that the, there wasn't enough uh, capacity for testing, and there still isn't. We really needed three to five times as much SARS-CoV-2 uh, testing as was available. And the, the reality is the surge of testing was so rapid and so large, there simply wasn't infrastructure in place, both at the laboratories, but at, at the manufacturing level, it was just not contemplated that this kind of demand could occur so rapidly. And even if the, the manufacturers, and, and the, by the way, the vast majority of infectious disease testing is, is done in large reference laboratories and uh, large hospitals and medium-sized hospitals, and it's the tests are provided by large and medium-sized manufacturers. Even if those tests were available, the laboratories couldn't process samples fast enough because they didn't have the experienced labor, they didn't have the testing infrastructure, and they didn't even actually have the devices used to collect the samples. And so there's one other thing that, that was key in this is that um, most people don't know uh, the United States, the in most of uh, the world, uh, medical diagnostics referred to as IVD or in vitro diagnostics, they have to go through a, a regulatory cycle. And it's in the United States, it's controlled by the FDA and they have to go through something called design control. And that requires a very stringent uh, process of designing the assays, testing them, validating them, and then scaling them up for manufacturing. And that just takes time. You can't flip a light switch and have that happen overnight. So here's two items which caused pitch points early in the pandemic. And on the left is how a nasal pharyngeal swab is collected. And you can see uh, this is a, a medical personnel sticking a swab into the back of the sinuses. And this at the time is considered the gold standard and still is considered the gold standard sample. I'm gonna show you some data in a second in a, from saliva where we're now getting good data that suggests that saliva 
probably is as good as nasal pharyngeal swabs for running these nucleic acid or NAT tests. There was a swab shortage. The manufacturers of swabs were not prepared for the surge. Uh, they have uh, responded and they are now making far more swabs, but that right there created backlogs. And secondly, as you can see, you need a trained medical personnel to, person to take this sample and thus you created another pinch point where people had to go into a laboratory or into a uh, physician's office to get this sample taken. And, and there just was too many people trying to do this too quickly. On the right are some of the reagents used in the uh, CDC assay. So the early assays were required reagents called RNA extraction reagents. It's a, it's a group of pretty specialized chemicals to extract the, the nucleic acids out of the samples and there were shortages of that and that required scaling in the manufacturers and that took time. Here's some data from a recent New England Journal of Medicine paper as, uh, in December of 2020 where they compare the viral load in saliva samples. These are matched samples to the viral load of SARS-CoV-2 in nasal pharyngeal swabs. And what the paper concludes is Basically, there's more viral RNA in saliva. Now think about it, saliva is a very easy sample to collect. People can actually self-collect. You just spit in a tube and that sample could be either mailed to a site or as you're gonna see later, can actually be tested by the person right there. They don't need specialized equipment to collect the sample and they don't need medical personnel to collect the sample. So. These are the platforms that nucleic acid tests were run on. On the left are what we call the medium throughput, or um, sometimes um, depending on the configuration, people can run these systems fairly high volume, but the upper uh, left instrument, that's, an, that's a nucleic acid extraction instrument. And that was where the shortage, the, the reagents required for that were in short supply early in the pandemic. On the right of that is a real-time PCR thermal cycler. This is the kind of equipment that many public health labs in this country use, where they have a separate instrument to isolate nucleic acids, and then they uh, manually pipette that into what are called 96-volt plates and run it on the instrument on the right. Well, th when the volume surged, you need something called a, a robotic pipetter or a liquid pipetter. That's shown at the bottom. There's shortages of those. so. The infrastructure for these labs didn't have the equipment they needed. They didn't have the reagents they needed. So the problem was this concentrated, everyone bring their sample to, to local sites for testing got overwhelmed. Now on the right are instruments that are high throughput instruments. These instruments have been around for a while, but they're not as widely dispersed. They're relatively uh, more expensive than the instruments on the left, but they're out there, they're just not as widely in use as we needed. And if more of these had been available and been the reagents had been and tests had been ready, we could have made a far earlier major impact in the pandemic. So the US government is supporting these manufacturing scaling efforts. BARDA, NIH, Department of Defense are all uh, involved in helping scale manufacturing. Uh, the current system, we need it. There's no going back from where we are. We have to have centralized high volume and uh, medium volume testing for a variety of other types of testing, not just SARS-CoV-2, but a decentralized testing model could help alleviate the bottlenecks. If people could do the testing at home, they wouldn't have to get into uh, the physician's office or testing laboratories. And the facts are that people have been doing at-home testing for a long time anyways. There's been home pregnancy tests are actually basically a, a diagnostic test. Blood glucose monitoring, that's basically a diagnosis test. These are, these are things that have been around for a long time. So these forces I've been referring to is that the miniaturization of uh, molecular diagnostics technology, the rise of telemedicine in this pandemic, they all are now forcing people and allowing or enabling people to do testing at home when the tests are available and they now are becoming available. And I'll talk about that in a, a subsequent slide. But the fact of the matter is people for a long time have been interested in the testing that's being done on their body. They want to be involved in decision-making and all these forces are, are driving 
diagnostic testing to the home. And in the long run, this will be a good thing for the next pandemic. And there will be a next pandemic. There's been three SARS species or a subspecies have arisen in the last 20 years. So there's no reason to think we're, this is the last one we're going to see. But for other types of infectious disease testing, like uh, sexually transmitted diseases, hopefully someday those kinds of tests can be done at home too. So recently the FDA has approved, issued EUA, so emergency use, use authorization for two uh, self-administered, self-collected at-home SARS-CoV-2 test. One's an antigen test, and the second one is a nucleic acid test. Now, this is the first time that we've actually had a nucleic acid test at home approved. It's, you have to get a prescription for it, but you collect the sample, you run the state-of-the-art nucleic acid amplification at home for an infectious disease. Now, this is obviously... Um, still got some constraints. There's manufacturing straight constraints, but it's a for great first step to get to decentralize the testing. So the second test that I refer to that received in EUA is an antigen test. These tests are much simpler. And that side of the diagnostic industry, they are capable of scaling very quickly. They have large volume, but these two kinds of tests together are really going to make a dent in the shortfall in nucleic acid testing. But then there's this other area that could be of very high importance in regards to the vaccine and these variants of concern. And that is in the idea of immunization passport. There's been a lot of talk about this. And let me just say from the get-go, the science is still out on this. It's not clear if this is going to be real. It's not clear that just having antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 means that you're um, not infectious or that you may not get infected by another variant. But neutralizing antibody assays at this time look to be the best hope for immunity passports. And these types of assays, I think some, it's, someday we may see these kinds of uh, antibody testing. Neutralizing basically means these are antibodies that they know block the virus from infecting cells. At this point, we believe that they're the best indication of immunity, but there's a lot of science still ahead. That's all I have. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to present this. So I'm going to close today's session. I want to first thank each of the panelists for their really inspiring talks. This um, showing how innovation can happen both on campus and uh, in leadership and in science and in the regulatory agencies and getting more tests approved. And so. Thank you all. It's been really inspiring to hear from you. And thanks to all of our attendees for joining us this afternoon. Mm -hmm.